Last time I came in here, this way. Ready whenever you are, Bill. Okay. Hello, all. Um, welcome to uh, the Potato Showcase Week, day two, um, where we are talking about some um, research projects um, which uh, we've, we've got uh, going on with uh, looking at potato rotations, black leg management, uh, aphid management with Dr. Mark Allison, um, Andrew Webster, um, Professor Ian Toad. Um, We've got Jane Thomas um, and Andy Evans as well. And um, I'm going to be your, your host for today uh, whilst we go through these topics. My name is Bill Watts and I'm the Knowledge Exchange Manager um, for the Western Wales with AHDB. So, just a few housekeeping things before we start. Um, you're all on mute. Um, so if you want to ask questions, and I'd encourage you to do so, um, you can do that through the questions tab uh, on the little box that you should have somewhere around your screen. Uh, there's a chat and questions function into the questions one that you're going to want. Um, I'd say try and get them in early as, as you're doing them because we do tend to get quite a few questions. Um, so if you want yours answered, then, then, then get them in early. Um, Time-wise, we're probably we're going to take about an hour and a half. So we've got an hour of um, presentation content, maybe a little bit more, um, and then sort of 20 minutes, half an hour of, of questions afterwards. Um, basis and Rosso. So um, we've applied for Basis and Rosso points. Um, you need to basically put your your number and name and, and postcode into uh, the chat function on on your sidebar and then uh, we will we will get those for you um, another thing just to think about um, this but well the, the presentation is being recorded so we will get the recording to you in an email um, sometime tomorrow um, and also on the, the the sidebar we've got a handout section um, so if you go into the handout section there are two handouts one which is a black plague fact sheet which Ian's provided us with um, which is very very good that's only just come out so I'd, I'd encourage you to look at that we've also got the arable review document which um, looks at projects that we've got um, you know in the wider context uh, there's, there's lots of different projects going on um, and specifically if you went to page 26 and onwards you would see the breadth of research that, that AHD new potatoes has got uh, going on at the current time so this is this is really a snapshot um, but there's a lot more going on as well um, uh, a little bit later in the uh, program we're going to have a poll section um, to do with aphids so please do uh, contribute to that and that will help our speakers out um, as well just to look at what the next 90 minutes is going to look like in, in a bit more detail you can see the slide here we've We've basically got 20 minutes or so uh, on rotations, then the 20 minutes on the black leg, and then 20 minutes on aphids. Um, very lucky to have our five speakers there. Um, yeah, looking forward to the, the open panel session. So, good questions. I think that's about it um, for now. So, uh, I will hand over to um, Dr. Mark Allison, who's going to kick us off with rotations work ah yes i'll do the clicking <laughs> you tell me when mark okay um well good afternoon thank you bill for the introduction so what we're going to do for the next sort of 20 minutes or so is talk about an ahdb funded program looking at rotations um this is actually a pretty large program, and I'm only really concentrating on quite a small component of it. And if you look down the bottom of this slide, you'll see the various other partners that are involved in the project, all contributing sort of various skill sets you know, to actually make this project work. So what I'm going to really be looking at this afternoon is looking at integration of either using cover crops in rotations or using organic amendments, things like manures or composts. And the 
but this is going to be a bit of a double header. So I'm going to be looking at the science side of it, some of the experiments, and presenting some of the results. And then when I finished, I'll hand over to Andrew Webster, who's one of our sort of collaborating growers. And he's going to talk about, in some ways, perhaps the more difficult part of it, it actually sort of taking the science and then integrating that into in making it work on, on the farm. And I think his experience is going to be really interesting to hear. So if I could have my, my next slide. So what I thought I'd start off with is just to explain like the methodology of what we've been up to. So what we have here in the, 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 the large from the picture is uh, a Google Earth image taken towards the end of September in 2018. And you can see a sort of green field with a uh, brown colored strip running through it. Now this green area is a mustard cover crop. And the brown area is a strip where the grower didn't plant the cover crop. So in this case, it's 12 meters wide, 240 meters long. And the little image uh, in the uh, top left-hand side just shows you what, had, what it would look like if you're actually standing within the, one of the, the unplanted strip. So these experiments are actually quite simple to set up. So basically they're just strip trials where the grower has done something on one part of the field and something else on another part of the field. Okay, so that's how it's all been set up. So eventually the cover crop gets ploughed in. Next spring, we plant our potato crop. Following autumn, we take some samples of the cover crop, uh, of the potato crop, excuse me. And basically what we do where those yellow dots have just appeared, that's our first set of potato samples. So they've been sampled where the cover crop has been grown. And if I have the next, set of four dots please bill there we are and then and we take another set of samples where there's been no previous cover crop and we take those samples back to the lab grade them measure the yield measure the dry matter other parameters and that is the basis of this part of the program and the point i guess of these experiments is they're simple they're fairly sort of cheap and cheerful uh, but they can actually generate some quite interesting data, and that's what we're going to be discussing a little bit later. So if I can have my next slide, please, Bill. So this is just the, the yield, potato yield, from that experiment we just looked at. So in the control area, which was the bare soil, if you look uh, across those data, we can see what the tube of fresh yield was there, and that was about 50, just over 59 tonnes a hectare. But when we have a cover crop, you can scroll along and you can see the yield where we had the cover crop was nearly 62 tonnes a hectare. So numerically, it looks like where we have a cover crop, we can increase, the yield has increased. Now, the big problem with strip trials is you're never quite sure whether the yields you're looking at are due to the treatments, in this case, the cover crop, or they're due to some other aspects, perhaps soil fertility or some variation which you haven't accounted for. So individual strip trials aren't of much use, but if we do lots of them and then combine them together, then you actually end up with a really useful data set. So if you go on to the next slide, please, Bill. So this is the experiments we did uh, up to 2019. And as you can see, we've got 67 experiments dotted around the country, so done some right down in the far southwest, uh, one uh, up in Scotland, uh, quite a few in East Anglia, going across to the West Midlands. And just to put uh, Andrew into context, he is in uh, the northwest of the um, UK, and there's a little cluster of experiments that are concentrated on the farm, one of which uh, Andrew will be talking about a little bit later. So what we can do is look at these data, and these experiments aren't necessarily all cover crop experiments. There'll be a mixture of cover crop experiments, like experiments where we looked at uh, different organic amendments, organic manures or composts, and some of them being actually due to cultivations as well, all feeding in to construct a large database of results which we can then analyze. So if we uh, move on to the next slide, and we can start looking at some results. So these are just some data 
from lots of individual experiments where we start to combine them together to actually look at what happens on average. So this is the effect of a cover crop, and it should be, I need to sort of point out, these are just all, all different types of cover crops. So some will be cover crops where the grower is interested in just producing biomass, which they can plow in. Some of them will be perhaps interested, perhaps more of a, a green manure effect, perhaps where they're interested in nitrogen release from the cover crop, which will then be uh, fed, uh, made available for the subsequent potato crop. Some uh, may be um, quite small cover crops where we're actually interested in trying to dry the soil out before we cultivate in the spring. So there's a whole different range of, it, uh, of cover crops here, and I haven't differentiated between any of them. So if we actually start to look at the data, so along the bottom axis, um, there's a, a series of dates and experiment numbers just showing you experiments. And then on the y-axis, we have the total fresh weight yield of the potato crops. So the open bars are the control yields. And what I've done there is then the blue uh, bar is the effect of the cover crop. And I've arranged them in the, the order of the, the size of the effect of the cover crop. So in some cases, if you look at the left-hand side of the graph, the effect of the cover crop was negative. So where we had a previous cover crop, the yield was smaller than when we had no cover crop. But as you move across the, the graph, you can see uh, the, the effects become positive. And right towards, uh, so the last uh, experiment was 2018 experiment 29, we actually had quite a large numerical benefit of the cover crop. So what I've done then is just look at the averages for the three different years, which is 2017, 2018, and 2019. And you can see in 2017, a very slight negative effect of cover crops, but 2018 and 2019, much larger positive benefits of having a previous cover crop. And over all three years, you can see there's about a two to three ton benefit of growing, having a cover crop before our potato crop. Okay, so that's the cover crop um, experiments to date, and we've got another 10 or 12 of them dotted around the country this year. Again, a couple of them with Andrew, and a couple of them, again, sort of more of them sort of in the general geographic range we showed in that earlier, earlier graph. So if you move on to the next slide, please, Bill. And this is the exactly the same sort of layout of data, um, but this is effects of organic amendments. And again, I haven't differentiated yet on the type of organic amendments. So these may be um, Manures, there may be compost, uh, there may be sort of, of you know, mushroom compost or municipal waste, green waste compost. I haven't differentiated yet between any of the, the different types. All I've looked at is the overall effect of those on the subsequent yield of the potato crop. And again, in some cases, we see a negative effect. That's the far left hand side of the graph. Towards the right hand side of the graph, we see more positive effects. And again, I've got the averages for 2017, 2018, and 2019, and the overall mean for all those experiments. And overall, there was, a, again, a positive benefit, but less so than we found for the organic, um, for the cover crops. So because we've now got quite a large range of comparisons, we can then start to do some statistics. And if you can show the next graph, please, uh, Bill. So what we can do is combine all the data and do a statistics called a pet t-test. And that can help us analyze whether the differences we're seeing overall are significantly different or not. So just to do, uh, to start with the cover crops, uh, the cover crops on average, average of all those experiments, that increased yields by about 2.9 tons a hectare. And when you analyze all those experiments collectively, we can show that increase was statistically significant. There's a real effect there that where we have a cover crop, that is associated with a significant increase in yield of our potato crop. And we get benefits of 2.9 tons per hectare on average. For the 
organic manures, uh, we had a yield increase on average of 1.9 tonnes. But because the, the increase was actually quite small, and also we had some also some negative effects or, uh, or a larger proportion of negative effects where we had the organic renewers, that effect was not significantly different. And ongoing work at the moment is actually starting to look at if we split those organic uh, amendments down into types of organic manure, can we actually say, well, on average, uh, green manure, uh, green waste compost gives a, a bigger benefit than perhaps other kinds of manure. So we're actually trying to break this data down now to actually have a look at why the, the, the response is perhaps smaller than we would have expected. Okay, um, so on average, um, we can see, say for the cover crops, we have a, a benefit, significant difference, uh, and a, a, a smaller benefit from the organic manures. So we move on to the next slide, please. So in conjunction with looking at experiments in the field, we also have some survey data. And this is some really simple survey data we, we conducted um, during the course of the programme. And we basically asked people who are growing cover crops how much it costs them to, you know, how much the seed cost, how much it costs to plant the cover crop, establish it, to manage the cover crop, and then finally to destroy it. And we looked at those costs or those operations and we put a value or cost against them just using standard uh, industry uh, values, either John Nick's uh, pocketbook or the Agricultural Contractors Handbook, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's how we uh, did the survey. And if we go on to the next slide, please, Bill. And that's, this is just summarized all the data we have to date. And this is the uh, basically I've summarized the seed costs and the total costs. And if we just look at, for example, the, the, the average cost, which is the 50th percentile of this particular graph, we can see the average cost of seed was about 47, ton, uh, 47 pounds per hectare. And the average uh, total cost, so the seed and all the operations used to establish the cover crop and then destroy it, was about 209 and a big range in um, costs as well. So in some cases, we had really simple um, establishment where perhaps you're just using um, a bit of grain that's falling out the back of the combine, scratched it in, and that's your cover crop. In some cases, far more expensive, we're actually using quite expensive mixes and much more intensively managed. But if we just concentrate on the, the average cost, the 50% percentile cost, just over 200 pounds per hectare. So if we just look at those costs and the value of the, potato, the extra yield of potatoes, we get nearly three extra tons of potatoes. Just on that basis, we could probably justify the cost of using a cover crop. And that's a, a really sort of quite simple analysis. And that does ignore all sorts of other things. And the next slide, please, Bill, is perhaps an added benefit Cover crop. So this is some data collected in the, uh, it's actually at the spot farm at southwest at Dillington in Somerset. The data actually collected by Anne Stone, who works for HDB. And what she did, she sat on a, a, a tractor while it was moving a uh, cultivating field that had strips of cover crop or no cover crop. And what she did was measure the work rate and also the fuel consumption. And if you can See that look at those data. This is we haven't got many examples of this, so it'd be really nice to get more examples. But you can see that on average, uh, where you have a cover crop or no cover crop, the work rate really doesn't change. But there is a big difference in the fuel consumption as the tractor moves from areas of no cover crop to where we have a cover crop, the fuel consumption falls because you're actually working in better quality soil. It takes less energy. To draw the implement through the soil, and that's a, that is again a cost saving. And these, this kind of information we need to sort of look up in more detail. So that's an added benefit of cover crops. One of the big unknowns, which again we're, we're working on to a certain extent in this project, but also in other AHTV projects, it is straight on the next slide. And we know that a cover crops, or no particular species of cover crops, can be host to 
potential pests and diseases, one of which is free living nematodes. And before we all rush down the route of everyone growing cover crops without really thinking about it, we just need to be aware there are these downsides and they could easily outweigh all the other benefits we see from cover crops. So this is very much work in progress. We're actually sort of starting to look at this in a little bit more detail and hopefully we'll be presenting this uh, a little bit later on. Okay, and I think getting towards the end, uh, a couple more slides. So uh, one of the next slide is just very briefly mention organic amendments. So this is some data or from where we've looked at green waste uh, compost, where we've got 11 examples of green waste compost. Um, all the compost has been analyzed uh, through a lab where we can look at the nutrient, compost, co uh, the nutrient value of the compost we've applied. And essentially what we have here is if we apply 30 tons of green waste compost, if we look at the far right hand column, what I've tried to do there is estimate the value of those compost solely in the value of the nutrients to the potato crop. So we have in this example about 88 pounds worth of phosphate, 35 pounds per hectare worth of potash, a bit of magnesium, which I've had to guess at, a bit of sulfate you um, had to guess at. And I think in total that probably comes to about 180 um, pounds per hectare in terms of value. The value, the table below, the blue table, are some figures supplied to me by Tony Bambridge, who uh, is BNC Farming in Norfolk. He has uh, an on-site green waste facility, and basically he supplied me with some figures, just his estimates of what it costs to transport green waste around the countryside uh, and to spread it. And if you actually look at that, the total of that is you know, 230 pounds per hectare. So the nutrient benefit is less than the cost of transporting and spreading. Now, what that analysis ignores at the moment is really the value of carbon, which is the top line in the, in the orange label. When you apply green waste compost, you're supplying an awful lot of carbon to the soil. What is the value of that? To the following potato crop and also in the rotation. And that again is a bit of ongoing work. Uh, this is actually being done by Andy Whitmore at Rothamsted, where we're actually sort of using computer models to actually work out what is the value of the carbon we add in organic, in this case green waste, but also perhaps in other kinds of organic amendments. And again, once that data is present, uh, collated and analyzed, that will also be made available to the industry. Okay, next slide, please. So very quickly, sort of wrap up before I hand across to Andrew. So we can show sort of benefits from using cover crops. Um, I guess a little bit disappointingly, the benefits from organic amendments are a little bit smaller. As I stressed, I think we need to be very careful before we all rush down the route of applying, uh, using cover crops because there may be downsides and it's important we understand exactly what they are. And one thing I haven't really sort of touched on, but uh, we have sort of got, again, some data on this, is really looking at uh, the effects of cover crops and organic amendments and soil physical properties, and particularly things like bulk density, soil strength, its uh, resilience to sort of water droplet damage, you know, from irrigation or heavy down, uh, uh, downpours of rain. So again, that is information we're collected together, and again, will be released in, in due course. So that is a bit of a fly through some of the science background to this um, project. And I'm now going to hand across to Andrew, and he can say, talk about the perhaps more interesting side of actually integrating that in, into farming systems. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I was asked in 2016 to, uh, Mark asked me what I participate in this. We was grateful to be asked. Uh, one thing, that we have up in Lancashire is variables. And what I mean by variables, our soil can vary a lot. And we can start off with a white silica sand onto a black sand, we end up on boulder clay, and we've only gone 100 meters across the field. The other major uh, variable we have 
is the weather. And as Mark's seen in the past, we, we it does alter. Come the next slide, Bill, please. This is the data of our rainfall from January 2000 to end of June 2020. And you can see the box along the bottom. It's the, the red bars are the highest rainfalls we've had in a month down to the greens which is the lowest it gets a bit frustrating in september when we've had 196 millimeter rain one year and we have 9.5 another year it's one of the things we have to do so looking after our soil is a major issue for us and it's not just in the springtime, it's in the autumn when we're coming to harvest potatoes as well. Come next slide, please, Bill. So what got me on the cover crop run? Um, 2008, 2009, we were growing fodder, we grow fodder beet on farm. And we we're fetching farmyard manure back. Um, we was fetching it back, spreading it, and then in the fodder beet crops, what well, we put manure on, we was then spending money controlling wild oats. And I sat there working the cost out and the next don't know how many years worth of working it, trying to get rid of the wild oats. And then around about 2009, 2010 in the press was all about black grass and resistance to chemical and all that what went with it. So that started to ring alarm bells because anyone who knows the dairy farmers the livestock farmers if they can buy straw in cheaper they will so if it's contaminated with black grass it's got resistance in it i didn't want it on the farm so it was like what can we do so started it was in the press at the same time about cover crops it was mostly the mustards and um, biofumigation sowing it after winter barley working it in in uh late october early november getting it plowed down it wouldn't work for us so the soil would slump with the mat rainfall we get where we are it was a difficult thing to try and work around discussing with people um we got around it we started using the oil radishes and went on that way come next slide please bill so 2016 mark contacted me about going on the program and what could we do so i explained to him that my eldest son christopher was at harper adams and we'd set this trial site up and what we were looking at we were growing cover crops but was we establishing them right without the trial work we didn't know so this is a what we got what we set up my son set up and we did the work with him as well to try and work out what was right do nothing just direct drill it or go to the expense of a lot of money the lemkin dolomite is a subsoiler with a big coon tiller on the back it most expensive so which way would work what we did find out doing nothing direct drilling for us produced the least amount of organic matter. The plots were sown with black oat and vetch and the rest of the field was sown with oil radish. There was plots left, as Mark said before, the hardest thing to do is leave a plot. So it was like, what can we do? And justifying what we were doing. So the like the minimum till for us at that trial to 12.8 tons to the hectare was direct sowing, direct in. The best was 32 tons per hectare. It was a trial that had to be set up early. It weren't the oil radish we like to use because it would have matured too early and uh, would have seeded, would have gone to head and gone woody. So it weren't quite. So we chose black oat and vetch come next slide please bill so 
I said, leaving a plot, looking down that center of that picture to the right and to the tractor, that is an average of 35 ton to the hectare of black oat and vetch. To the left is nothing, just as bare ground over winter. Exactly the same, it's all the same soil type, it's not, don't change in that patch of the field. All the same cultivations. So what was the difference? Well, the difference was a Megastar D stoner was doing between a half and one kilometre an hour faster in the cover crop ground. Even though it had all that organic matter to work with as well, it was still going faster. It was one of the easiest things for us to justify in the cover crop, where we were going with cover crop. Where we had the oil radishes, tillage radish, we was going even faster and there was an even greater biomass there. So that was proving to us we are do it was doing some good. Come next slide, please, Bill. So we're going along and what we choose. And it's like Mark says, we can all choose an oil uh, a cover crop, but which one? What's going to work for us the best? It um the cover crop, it's do we want something cheap or do we want something that costs a lot of money? We use tillage radish, the more, more expensive multi-purpose, gives glycosinolates out through the roots. We do get a bite, we do get the biofumigation because we don't spray them off in the spring. We chop them in and put them straight in front of the, whether it be in front of potatoes or whether it be in front of fodder beet. We've tried black oat and vetch. In 2017, when that trial was on, it was a dry spring. It worked all right. 2016, we had a wet spring and the land took a lot of drying out. We was having to dry it out three, four days after topping it down. Oil radish, we were straight in, straight away. But we've also to look at, like Mark says, these cover crops can increase or decrease our nematodes. Uh, one example we found this year is beans. Uh, there's a nematode that attacks beans. It's one of its hosts are oats. So if you're putting a, you're growing beans, you've got, um, oats in a cover crop and oats in the rotation you can be increasing that nematode level and making it um increase a lot more than what you want it to so it's this thing we can have a positive yes we've uh, increased the organic matter but at the expense of the nematodes so it's creating that fine balance finding a lot with the more i learn the more I realise we've a lot more to learn and we'll get along the way. Come next slide, please, Bill. So this year, COVID-19 is it. Um, on the farm, we're not just doing the cover crop trials. We are doing a lot more. Uh, and I think they all complement each other because we're not going to have one thing create uh, finishes uh, gets everything done at once uh we meant to have a farm event in july uh end of july that mark asked me to host but unfortunately we can't go ahead so just give me a bit of a rundown what we're doing yeah we've got mark's cover crop we've got the icl potash plus polysulfate in the trial as well we're putting limex in front of potatoes for calcium for storage see how we get on with that Eurofins have got a fungicide trial on the farm as well. Sulfur application on winter wheat, we're doing that in conjunction with CF Fertilizer. It's the second year we're running that, chucking some interesting data up. We have fodder wheat trials uh, on the farm. We're just starting a trap crop with uh, nightshades. Um, we're hopefully sowing it tomorrow once the rain stops today. And then we're doing some mechanical weeding with. Uh, some grimy hillers this year, what we've got. So we're constantly trying to improve things. It's not just cover crops. What we've got to realize is, yes, we can do good, but we've also to be cautious 
that we don't do harm to the soils with putting the wrong cover crops in and increasing nematodes. There is those nematodes that can reduce, but there's also hosts. So thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. That's excellent. Thank you very much there, Andrew and Mark. Um, very, very interesting um, presentation. I'm sure uh, we will have plenty of questions shortly uh, to go through. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on to Ian and we'll come back for the panel session later. Just before we do, um, I know there have been a number of people who have joined us uh, in the last 20 minutes or so. So if you're looking for basis and Amoroso points, you need to put your, um, your number, your name and your postcode into uh, the chat uh, function um, and then we'll get you registered for those. Um, I'll pass over to uh, Ian now, um, we're going to talk about some black leg. Thank you Bill and um, good afternoon everyone, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today about black leg disease and give you an update on some of the research that we've been doing. Next slide Bill please. Um, before I do, I just want to say that as part of a recent AHDB Scottish Government project, uh, myself and the team that you can see on the bottom left have just produced this Black Leg Essentials fact leaflet. And uh, it's there really for two reasons. One is just to update you on some of the Black Leg facts, just out of interest. And secondly, in the hope that it might raise some questions for this or for future meetings. So please do have a look if you get the chance. Thanks, Bill. Um, just a, a very quick introduction before I go into some of the research. Black leg disease in the UK is predominantly caused by an organism called Pectobacterium atricepticum. And this is a picture of it. Next slide, Bill. And the reason I'm telling you this is because you might use the name Awinia. It used to be called Awinia, so it's changed to Pectobacterium atricepticum. You might also have heard of other names, Brasiliensa, Dickia solani. These are all um, bacteria that cause black leg disease, but it's only really Pectobacterium atricepticum that we need to worry too much about because over 80 or 90% of all black leg cases in the UK is caused by this organism. Mostly the rest are uh, problems on the continent. Okay, thanks, Bill. I don't have data for England and Wales on historical black leg incidents, but I have a really nice one here from Scotland. You can see along the bottom, starting from 1964 all the way up to 2012, um, the, the different years and up the side you can see the percentage crop area affected with black leg so the higher the peak the more black leg and you can see that in the 60s we had quite an issue with black leg. In the 70s and 80s that was greatly reduced mainly because of much improved storage and storage as you know keeps getting better and better. But then also, probably in the early 90s, we introduced certification and uh, crop inspections in seed, and that also had a big effect on seed quality. At that time, we also started to grow microplants in the laboratory, which were completely free of the pathogen, and these were used for mini tubers. And therefore, when you first plant your, your first potatoes in the ground, we know that they're completely free of the pathogen. But you'll see towards 2012, you can see this small increase. Actually, it's a small increase compared to this graph, but compared to what we'd had over the 10 or 20 years before, it's actually been quite a big increase and we don't yet understand the reasons for it. Okay, thanks, Bill. We know that when you plant mini tubers in the ground, they can quite quickly become contaminated with Pectobacterium, either through the air, by insects, close proximity to neighboring crops showing signs of black leg, pulverization, which I'll come back to, uh, rainwater and irrigation water. Next slide. And also through the soil. We know that these are soil dwelling organisms, and this is really important. Things like Dickia solani, we think is purely spread by uh, seed potatoes, 
With Pectobacterium atricepticum, we believe that this is an organism that lives normally perfectly happily in all soils, probably across the whole of the UK, and we know that it can live quite happily on the roots of plants, and we think that that's its normal lifestyle. So we could get these organisms contaminating tubers through the soil, or if you have weed species close that have the bacteria on the roots. We also know that it can be in groundwater, and as you get very heavy rainfall, your groundwater raises up to tuber level and can contaminate that way. Next slide, Bill. And farmyard machinery can also cause a problem. We know that we can transfer pectobacterium on machinery. It's very easy to, easy to identify this bacteria on different machinery. The difficult part, of course, is cleaning it. And we know the, the difficulty in cleaning some of these big machines and the practicality of it. But the fact remains that whether it's machinery, it's the soil or it's the air, we still don't know what the major sources of this contamination are. And until we know that, it's very difficult to do anything about it. So part of our research is to try to find this out. Next slide, Bill. When you have contamination of your crop, we know that the bacteria start to multiply slowly and they reach reasonably high levels mainly on their roots and tubers in about uh, June and that's when we first start seeing signs of blackleg and the bacteria just continue to multiply and so they're at the highest if they if they're going to be there at all they'll be at the highest towards the end of the season just before burn down and that means it's very important when you destroy your canopy that you try to desiccate your plant as much as possible and that's because the bacteria like to grow on living plants but they like just as much to grow on dead plants as long as there's greenery there if you can remove that greenery and desiccate them completely then it's very difficult for them to increase in number and spread that's why losing sulfuric acid has uh, at least been a worry for people because sulfuric acid is extremely good at desiccating the canopy Dicot's done a good job, but of course, we've lost that as well. And so people are using pulverization more and more. Probably not such a serious thing for ware crops because you're not going to replant your um, potatoes, but uh, an important consideration for seed. Thanks, Bill. This is a graph showing how blackleg occurs in the field. You have your, spec your inspectors going out looking in this case at a seed crop over the season and you have the dates along the bottom and you have the number of black leg plants per hectare up the side. And if you look at the green and red lines, you can see as the season goes on, your black leg starts to appear and can increase very, very quickly towards the end of the season. And so if you do an inspection and you see that black leg's present, say on your first inspection, on the second inspection, you see that it's got a little bit worse, there's a good chance that that black leg is going to continue to take off and just get worse. And it can get worse much more quickly. So it's really important when you see black leg in the field, that especially if it's getting worse over the weeks, that you consider that this is not a linear effect. This could increase very rapidly, very quickly. OK, thanks. We know that good storage has made a huge difference to the amount of blackleg that we get. But to get from storage to the field where your tubers are going to be planted, they have to be transported usually, unless they're on the same farm. And um, they're not going to go straight from the transporter into the field, so they have to be stored. And we know that they're not always stored in a high quality store. Sometimes they might be just left in the farmyard, even for two or three weeks, maybe covered in tarpaulin before they get into the field. And I've actually seen examples of this. And so we're asking questions, what happens to the amount of bacteria on the tuber from coming out of storage into the transporter? And then what happens before it actually gets planted in terms of storage? What happens in terms of the temperature? What happens in terms of the moisture? Because they're the two things that really make a big difference. 
We're also looking at transport in boxes and in poly bags because there's, a, there's, there's been a, a question about whether poly bags can increase moisture. We've got some very basic data that suggests that boxes keep the num bacterial numbers down better, but it's really too preliminary to offer any um, kind of uh, suggested route to go. Thanks, Bill. We've been trying to look at disease resistance. We know that things like late blight and PCN, you have a single gene within a plant that determines whether it's resistant or not to these bacteria. We've looked and looked for pectobacterium, but this single gene just isn't there. We're currently looking at resistance in a species called Solanum foreca in our Commonwealth potato collection, which has something like 1500 different types of potato in there, but we can't find this single gene. And we're almost certain now that any resistance or tolerance that you see to flat leg disease in potato is due to what we call field resistance, which is much more a collection of different genes that work together to help with resistance. And actually breeding those into a commercial variety is very, very difficult. So my feeling is that we aren't going to see good resistant, truly resistant varieties in the near future although some big seed houses are certainly trying to do it. Thanks, Bill. We're looking at a new control method, so there are options. We're working with a company called APS Biocontrol to look at the application of something called a bacteriophage to our crop. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria, and you can find these very specific bacteriophages that will only attack Pectobacterium atraceptacum, so they're safe. And we'll, they're, they're already used by APS Biocontrol in pre packed potatoes as a way to protect the potatoes and increase their shelf life. And we're currently working with them on foliar applications to see whether we can reduce contamination and therefore black leg disease. And that project is ongoing at the moment. Thanks, Bill. We're working with SRUC, Scottish Agricultural College in Scotland, looking at precision agriculture and the use of drones. And you can see these three panels of potato plants from above. The first one is normal light, and it's a little bit difficult to see, but where the box is, you can see that there are two or three plants showing signs of black leg disease. And if you shine different lights on them, you can actually very clearly differentiate between the healthy plants and the diseased plants. And if you look at the third panel, what this allows you to do is actually select the healthy plants, differentiate them from the unhealthy plants, and it gives you a percentage coverage of your field, which can help you to monitor the amount of black leg that you might have. This, of course, means that you don't have to walk through your crop and do any damage, but it also means you could fly your drone over. It could even be done with a satellite and you wouldn't have to fly anything and get an idea of how black legs progressing in your crop and potentially other diseases. Thanks, Paul. What I want to finish with is uh, a new project. This is a big project worth two million pounds. Um, and it's on a decision support tool for black leg disease. And I'm going to mention four different things about the project. The first one is irrigation. I think everyone knows if you put too much water on a potato crop, you can increase black leg. And usually that's because you have a contaminated seed crop and the water encourages the bacteria to grow. But we did an experiment over the last few years where we planted mini tubers that we tested were completely free of the pathogen. We over irrigated them and we saw in some cases up to 7% black leg. For a, mini tube, for, a, for a first generation seed crop, it's unheard of. And the only way that that could have happened uh, because they were, the seed was clean of the pathogen is that they somehow managed to get into the plant and the irrigation was responsible or partly responsible for this happening. That's really important because that means that it isn't necessarily a contaminated seed tuber that leads to black leg. 
And what we think is happening is that the bacteria are able in certain situations to go in via the roots. And so we're working with Mark Stallen, who some of you will know, in Nayab Cuff to see if we can find out more about this. Very importantly, people irrigate partly on a, a wear crop because if you want to get rid of common scab, you need to irrigate because this is an organism that gets worse in dry conditions. But if you over irrigate, if you go past that threshold, you can actually encourage black leg to develop. So March looking at that fine balance between removing common scab and keeping black leg at bay. We're also working with Scottish agronomy who um, have for a while been saying that we think there's a relationship between nematodes in the ground and the amount of black leg that we, say, we see. So we've been working with them to see whether there's any um, truth in this. And what we've found recently, if we take pots with potato plants growing in them, we put pectobacterium in there, and in some cases we put free-living nematodes in there. Where the free-living nematodes are present, we can get 100 times more bacteria inside the plant than without the nematodes. And that's very good evidence, preliminary evidence, to suggest that nematodes in the field, probably via their feeding, but we don't really know how they do it, are helping the bacteria to get into the plant. So what we'd like to do, again working with Mark in Niab Cuff, but also biocrop science, is look to see whether irrigation has the effect of increasing free-living nematodes around the root systems and potatoes of your crop at any particular time during development, and then use the nematicide from Bayer, Vellum Prime, which you will know about, I'm sure, to see whether we can apply that nematicide to keep the nematodes at bay to ultimately control black leg disease. So we're in a really strange situation where we're looking to apply a nematicide to control a bacterial disease. And we look forward to trying to get the results of that uh, in, in the next couple of years. Next slide, please. The introduction from Mark and Andrew was really great because you, you're very aware of cover crops and the use that they are. But as Mark said, one thing that we don't know yet is what effect cover crops have on pathogens. I've said already that Pectobacterium probably lives on the roots of lots of different plants quite happily, and that's their natural um, domain. We have different types of cover crops, and we have a suspicion that Pectobacterium might live better on some than others. Certainly that's true in weed species. So what we want to do is to look at different cover crops, the four main four different groups, and look to see if these encourage Pectobacterium or, which is perfectly possible, we can find a cover crop that reduces Pectobacterium in the soil prior to potato planting. And I'll certainly be talking to Mark and Andrew more about this in the coming weeks. Next one, please. And then the final thing that I, I was going to talk about is a decision support tool for predicting black leg. This is to try and look at the at risk management for black leg and avoidance strategies. And I've shown this decision support tool here. This has nothing to do with black leg. This is taken from a completely different application, but it gives you an idea of what we're trying to do. In the left-hand box, you have an unmitigated risk. And this means that what is the risk of black leg if we do nothing? What's the likelihood of black leg occurring? What's the chance of it spreading? What's the impact of that going to be on the crop, on the econ economics, et cetera? Ultimately, what's the relative risk of not doing anything? And you can see this has gone red in this case. The mitigated risk, what, do we, what happens if we do something? You know, the likelihood will change, the spread will change, the impact will change, and hopefully the relative risk will change. This is things like, what happens if we use a cover crop? What happens if we use a tolerant variety? Um, uh, what happens if we manage our irrigation to uh, acceptable levels, et cetera? And we hope to put all this together and a lot more to try and come up with a decision support tool that is usable for the grower, and that's the purpose. Next slide, please. And then, and then finally, 
a very important part of the project, a, a part that's led by AHDB, is to talk to people like you and lots of others to get out there, hopefully in field trials and in seminars like this, to tell people about the work that we're doing and specifically about how to uh, how to implement the decision support tool and look at the economic value of using it. This, this is a nice picture at the top because it has Graham Bannister from AHDB, it has Mark Stallam from Niab Cuff, and it has Simon Alexander from SA Consulting, and all three of these are on this new project, and we look forward to working with them. Next slide, please. So this new project's quite exciting, and it has some real practical outcomes. For example, we might be able to give advice on managing irrigation, we might be able to give advice on which type of cover crop to use and when, on free living nematode diagnostics for fields and then ultimately on control, different biocontrol options, for example, the bacteriophage example, and then all this together and more in a decision support tool. Next slide. So just a reminder of some recommendations for control and the first ones in the field so the first one is, of course, you have to plant clean seed because even if the bacteria can go through the roots and in some situations and it doesn't rely on clean seed, planting clean seed is still a very, very important consideration. Keep weeds to a minimum because of the fact that they can harbor pectobacterium. Avoid over irrigation, burn down efficiently, harvest as early as is possible based on the, the fact that your black leg might be increasing and um, but you need to get a certain weight of yield because we know black leg can get worse very quickly and we have the new field treatments. Next slide, Bill. Away from the field, cleaning equipment's really important whenever possible and I know it's not always possible or practical. Keep tubers cool and dry in storage and if possible, monitor the temperature to make sure that your stores are holding those conditions. And then be really vigilant what happens when potatoes come out of storage and they're transported and then they're stored again before they get planted because what you're planting in terms of pectobacterium load could be very, very different to what came from the farm uh, for, with the seed. So it's really important that we consider that. Next slide, please. And then finally, I'm speaking, and I'm very proud to speak about this work. It's certainly not just my work. We have a huge team, both now and in the past, working on this. In fact, all these are live, all these are on live projects now, uh, both academic and industry. And we make sure, I make sure as an academic, that I work a, a lot with industry because a lot of the answers uh, are already there and certainly can lead us to better answers when we work together. Um, it's really important to thank AHDB for funding and for being part of this new project, Scottish Government and others for their funding as well, and all the people involved in the work. And thank you very much for listening. That's brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Ian. Very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and uh, it wasn't lost on me how many parallels there were it seemed with what i used to get up to with pcn and things and you know my, my old supervisor um was looking at interactions between rhizoctonia solani and pcn and things like that and um very very interesting stuff um so uh, for the people that have joined us recently um if you have questions for him which i'm sure you do um you can you can uh, use our questions section on the tab which you'll have on your screen um, and keep putting them in there. Um, now, uh, I think we're going to have a poll. That's what Christian's been been doing. Um, so before we head into our aphid management section, um, Jane and Andy have got a couple of questions for you. So we'll, we'll give you 30 seconds on that.
Right. Do you use mineral oils in your ACID virus management program? Mm -hmm. um, pretty much 50-50. Near enough. That's interesting. Um, have we got another one, Christian? Yeah. If yes, do you consider them an effective tool for reducing virus infection? Brilliant. Okay, 60% are in favour, yes. Um, that's very interesting. Thank you very much for contributing to that. Um, I will hand over to, to Jane um, and then subsequently Andy, and um, they're going to talk to us about that very subject. Cheers. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to um, be describing a project that has started uh, this year, um, looking at the effectiveness of, of aphid management programs in minimizing the spread of, of non-persistent viruses in seed crops. And it's a collaboration between SIUC, SAC Consulting, NIAB, SASA, and BIOS, who are handling the statistical analysis. It's okay, next slide, please, Bill. Okay, so just to give a bit of background to this, um, there was a project which we were also involved in at NIAB, which ran from 2011 to 2014, and that showed that mineral oil sprays um, could significantly reduce the incidence of potiviruses in seed crops. But there was a lot of variation between sites and seasons. Um, and in some of the trials that we did, there was no reaction of, of, um, or reduction of virus transmission at all. And with the oil that we used, which was called OLEH, uh, we did see some stunting and some scorching of the plants, um, but they generally recovered. And there was a big concern that crop inspectors um, would not be able to um, inspect crops adequately, but in the end, they saw a lot of the symptoms and concluded that it didn't adversely affect their ability to inspect seed crops. So that was one concern out of the way. Okay, next slide, please. So in the previous project, the first sprays were applied between 50 and 75% emergence and then continued weekly for nine weeks and that left some plant material uh, really unprotected at very early stages and again um, after burn down and since we completed that project there's been a couple of um, research papers published from from other countries um, which have prompted further investigation in the uk and that is particularly around the timing of initial sprays and the total number of sprays. And a, a couple of um, alternative or cultural control methods. So the work that we're doing now um, aims to investigate this timing, the initial timing and the number of mineral oil sprays that go on, the types of mineral oils, and then two cultural control options, um, which I'll describe later. So next slide, yeah, experimental approach. Um, we're using uh, Maris Piper, which is tested free from, uh, from virus and four row plots. And on each side of those plots, we've got a row of, of PVY infectors. And there are eight treatments in total and five replicates um, per treatment. And we've got yellow water traps stationed at each corner of the trial. And we're going to be looking at total yield and graded yields for seed tuber sizes. And importantly, at the end, we're going to be looking at ELISA tests to determine the virus incidence in harvested tubers. And the trial is in progress at Cambridge in 2020, this season. And we expected to have high virus pressure here, high aphid pressure, and that has proved to be the case. 
And then the trial will be probably more or less repeated in its same format in Scotland in 2021, where we expect to see some contrasting virus pressure. The next slide, please, Bill. Okay, so just to run through um, the treatment summary, uh, we have completely untreated plots um, and then an insecticide only treatment. And this is a, a full legal program um, with additional insecticide sprays added in um, as triggered by yellow water track catches. Um, and just to run through that insecticide program, we're starting with um, sprays of Sumi Alpha, two week intervals, then switching to Hallmark Xeon, two week intervals, adding in um, to Pecky and Insist as necessary, depending on yellow water track catches, and then moving to Mavento um, after flowering. Um, we then have um, um, an oil program, OLEH, um, plus the insecticide program overlaid with it. And that is really to give us um, comparison with previous work. So OLEH is, is not available for use um, in the UK at the moment, uh, but we wanted to uh, see that linkage with the previous results that we got in R449. Then looking at um, crop spray 11E um, applied to tuber initiation, which is permitted um, in the UK at the moment, and then switching to the insecticide program. And then we're looking at a, a new oil called Reaper. Um, that's um, not the name that it will be potentially known by um, in the UK. It's referred to as Basile Y in France. Um, and the um, Agent for it, which is Desangos, is hoping for mutual recognition um, by the end of the year um, so that it could potentially be used on seed crops um, in the UK next year. So we're looking at that um, plus an insecticide program. We're looking at it on its own. And then we're looking at it um, added into a, a couple of um, cultural control approaches. And the first one of these is uh, the use of straw as a ground cover. And that is um, designed to um, decrease the, the contrast um, between the, the ground um, and the crop and discourage aphids from landing on the crop leaves. And then we're looking at a, an intercrop, um, vetch in this case, and asking the question, does that intercrop, does it act as a barrier to aphid movement? or possibly um, is it some sort of stylet cleansing um, function that intercropping could perform? And both of those uh, treatments have been looked at um, on the continent and found to be um, partially effective in any case. Um, and I think the key difference from R449 is that we are looking at sprays commencing much earlier, 30% emergence, um, rather than 50 to 75 percent emergence and then weekly until no green material is left um, after burn down. So if I can have the next slide please Bill. Okay so just some some early observations on the trial which is still ongoing. There's our straw that was applied at um, the rate of five tons per hectare it stayed in place um, despite some extremely high winds at this site. Um, and then pictures of the vetch just establishing there. Um, and then it really did start to grow quite well um, and formed a nice barrier between the rows, starting to um, collapse a little bit now. Um, and we did use pre-emergence stomp only on the trial, um, which um, is, a, is a vetch safe um, herbicide to use. Okay, next slide please, Bill. Um, more early observations. Well, we reached 30% crop emergence just about the 19th of, of May, and our first sprays were applied actually just before 30% crop emergence, so uh, a timely spray um, because the last week in May saw some extremely high uh, vector pressure from peach potato aphid, as you can see there. These are our um, counts from the um, Ferra Yellow Water Trap service. So 
the plots put on uh, under a lot of pressure, really. Okay, next slide, please, Bill. Okay, so just some um, observations on the crop itself. We did look at, at plant height uh, about the third week in June. Um, and you can see there, I think all the treatments um, having a very slightly um, depressive effect on, on plant height, though there's no um, stats on this, this yet. And then the, the flowering, um, also quite interesting there, we did seem to see a bit of um, depression in the percentage of plants flowering with the Reaper plus wheat straw and Reaper plus vetch. And possibly there's some competition for water or some barrier to water getting through to the plants because we, we have had to um, irrigate at the site. Uh, but we'll see what these effects do to um, eventual tuber yields, um, if anything. Uh, I think perhaps the important thing that was that we saw um, really no clear phytotoxicity as browning or scorch effect um, with any of the oil treatments. And that was much more apparent in the previous work that we did. Uh, we used Estima there and now we're using Maris Piper. So maybe there's a, a variety effect. Um, we don't know. But the next slide, please, Bill. Um, that just shows um, uh, the only leaf I could find, this is in a reaper treated plot, uh, which showed any of the um, browning or phytotox um, symptoms that we've, we've seen with OLEH in the past. And I hope you can see that um, white arrow is just pointing to one leaf uh, where there is a very slight indication of a sort of trail of, of, of brown spotting going down a leaf vein which is possibly a scorch or a phytotox effect, but certainly not widespread at all, um, and an untreated plot there um, on the right. So, okay, I think I'm to hand over to, to Andy now. So he's got the next slide. Thank you, Jane. Um, yes, yeah, so as Jane said, we were hoping to do a trial in Scotland as well this year, but obviously due to the COVID uh, outbreak, uh, we want the trial. So we'll be doing the trial and repeating the treatments and maybe uh, you know we might pick up a couple of uh, things from uh, the trial that Jane is doing down at NIAB which may we may tweak some of the things but in reality it'll be a duplicate trial. And as Jane said uh, the virus pressure is likely to be less um, and in fact in Scotland this year the virus pressure kind of started a bit early, um, just like it did down at NIAB. But the the main aphid that was uh, the virus vector was the, the uh, willow carrot aphid. And if you look at the, the graph on the bottom left, which is from the yellow water traps run out of Ferra by HDB, um, the yellow curve is this season for the uh, willow carrot aphid. And it's at least double the national, the average over the last few years, which is the blue line, and way more than the red line, which was last year. But then it tailed off, and this is basically the the virus pressure throughout Scotland kind of tailed off really. When you look at the average virus pressure per trap, again last year we actually had probably had, um, which is the graph on the bottom right, we probably had a much higher virus pressure compared to what we've seen this year. Uh, which is the blue is the is the average and the orange is this year. So uh, next slide, please, Bill. So as I mentioned, the the, the virus pressure kind of increased. Uh, this is from just one uh, site in Grampian, but it's it's reasonably indicative for the whole of uh, Scotland, really. Where early in the kind of from the May onwards, the virus pressure started to increase. And then, of course, from about mid-June onwards, that's when we had the rain. And that's basically put a stop to, um, to any sort of um, further increases in virus pressure. And it doesn't mean that we can be complacent because obviously the weather is being pretty changeable. And I think there's always the potential that this month and in August, we might see a return to a typical summer and there may then be a, a sort of spike of if it flights going into the crops 
So we can't really take our um, eye off the ball when it comes to the uh, virus control options. Uh, next slide, please, Bill. So um, the, Scotch, the Scottish Aphid Virus Working Group, which comprises of SIUC, Scottish Agronomy, McCain, HDB, the Hutton, and SASA. Um, you now every year we develop a, a kind of um, guidelines for virus management. And this year we, we decided to come up with six steps for effective virus management, which are on the next couple of slides. And to be honest, a lot of them are very kind of obvious uh, very basic stuff, but again, it's useful to be reminded about how important some of these steps are. So, for example, locating your seed crops away from the sources of virus, particularly where you've got fields where there have been uh, cereal crops which have perennially had potato volunteers in, because we know that potato volunteers can be a very significant source of virus, because the aphids have to pick up the virus from somewhere. Um, some work that's been done overseas suggests that if you have cereal strips around your, your seed crops, that can divert incoming aphids. And a bit like what Jane was saying about stripping the virus out of the aphids, uh, if the aphids land in these cereal strips, when they probe the cereals, the virus gets stripped off the aphids' uh, mouth parts. Early removal of virus sources, uh, basically roguing. It's really important, I think, that we try and minimize the risk of any virus within the crop itself and basically roguing out any potatoes which look a bit dodgy is really a good thing just to make sure that there's uh, no sources of virus for the aphids to pick up. Uh, knowing the varieties, there's a, a variety resistance and a, a propensity uh, of um, varieties to virus infection. Uh, there's these databases which are on those links there. Again, it's useful to get an idea of if you're going to be planting a variety which is very uh, susceptible to be, um, picking up potato virus Y, for example. And if you're going to be growing some of these high-risk varieties, that's where maybe you really do need to focus your management um, approaches. Uh, next step, please, uh, slide please, Bill. So yes, uh, the final three steps really, and you know we've been talking about it already, tracking the enemy, looking at the aphid um, data, whether it's from suction traps or whether it's from the yellow water traps. And it's important as well to remember that, you know, it's not just the, the potato colonizing aphids, which are the problem. Um, like we've seen in Scotland this year, it's been the uh, willow carrot aphid. So, very often you won't actually find these aphids on the crop because they're, they're on the crop for sometimes less than a minute because they're there, they probe the leaf, they find out, oh, hang on, this isn't a carrot, and off they go. But in that time, they can pick up and transmit virus into your potato crops. Uh, so really, when it comes to the aphicides, as soon as aphids, particularly the virus carrying aphids are flying, start your spray program, uh, whether it's oils, whether it's just based on chemical insecticides and really follow the guidelines uh, all the way through to burn down because there's always the risk that if after burn down and you've got any regrowth those potatoes are very susceptible to having virus transmitted into them and the final step really is you know there are limitations with all of this um, the aphicides very often you know they don't kill quickly enough so there's always the risk that uh, you are going to get your transmission of potato virus Y, even if you are doing a full-on virus um, control program with aphicides. At least one of the aphid species, peach potato aphid, is resistant to the pyrethroid insecticides. There's a suggestion that the willow carrot aphid is going down that route as well. So, and we're losing aphicides. We've lost to plenum last year. We're not going to have uh, Biscaya thiocloprid next year. So we are going to be restricted in a lot of the aphicides that we're going to have available over the next few years, which again is another reason why we're doing this work to see how effective uh, the, uh, the oils can be. So I think I think that's me. So um, I think it's on to the questions.
Brilliant. Thank you very much there, Andy. That was grand. Um, yeah, if you saw any glitches or anything, or if I ask any of you a question um, going forwards, which you've already answered, I'm very sorry, but I've been trying to collate, collate the questions for about the last 15 minutes or so in between clicks. Um, so we've, we've got quite a few that have come in, which is great. Um, I might start with one for Andrew, I think, if I can find it. Um, it was pretty wet in Lancashire last year, Andrew. Um, <laughs> do you think um, cover cropping has helped mitigate um, the effects of the excessive rainfall? Have you seen a benefit to you last year? Yeah, um, last year we managed to get some in. Yeah, we lost some patches, we were what, flooded out. But it, it, any erosion, stuff like that, helps with drainage. The the oil radish deep rooting gets any compaction that's there get through it, and then in the spring we're seeing the soils dry out a lot quicker, and then it it seems to take the moisture the oil radishes take the moisture up, but then it delivers it back to us later on in the season, and we we it, we don't when we don't uh, glyphosate off, and we. Try not to chop it too fine, so that we have a nice structure left of what we've got. But yeah, it helps. That's good. That's good. And I suppose it, it brings me on to some of the stuff that Mark was talking about because, um, you know, there's some impressive results there. You, you, and as you, as you went into it, you know, you were talking about um, the yield benefits and things like that. But then the workability and then you of the soil you brought. Um, you know, you brought that up as well, Andrew, and how much of a benefit that is. Um, I've got a question here for Mark um, related to the, the wider project work, which is um, a comment on, because um, you're doing so much work, you've got so many um, different bits and pieces going on. There was, a, there was a question came through asking what types of green manure mixes you'd looked at and that you tested. Um, what designs you'd used, whether they were just the strip trials or whether they were split field trials, fully replicated, um, and what potato varieties um, had been looked at as well. So, it was just a small question. question there. So, basically, we've used several trial designs. So, it could be, sort of, as you say, sort of really simple strip trials, which are very easy to manage to set up, but they have their limitations, as I explained. But we've also gone to like more replicated work. Um, some cases, it's an extreme like sort of Andrew set up, uh, or his son uh, Chris set up, so sort of heavily replicated, lots of treatments, quite powerful trials, or anything in between. So we have a whole range of trial types, really depending on sort of local circumstances. Uh, in terms of potato varieties, again, we've just gone with the variety that the grower is going to put into that field, so it could be. In terms of sectors, we've got uh, had salads, we've had fresh market, we've had processing varieties, a complete range of determinacies. Uh, so quite a, a wide range of, of varieties have used. Um, and one of the things perhaps linking in to what I said before was with some of the surprising lack of effects of uh, the organic amendments is one thing I, I want to do is actually hone in on what varieties have been used where we've perhaps seen the negative effect of the organic amendments and try and look at that was that the, the, the lack of response or negative response almost a consequence of there being too much nitrogen floating over the system and suppressing yield in perhaps the more indeterminate varieties which we know they have too much nitrogen we tend to have a, a loss of yield so that's something we want to look at going going forward so, but yeah you're right it's a, a big program with lots of data and we're still sort of playing around with lots of it and hopefully to get something useful coming out of it Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, got a question in for Ian. So, um, with regards to black leg and an irrigation, um, and whether you know different irrigation systems um, are more likely to promote black leg symptoms, um, and specifically uh, is, is trickle irrigation. Are there any benefits to it versus boom or gun? Um, it's a really good question and there's a simple answer and that is that I really don't think we know what the answer is 
Uh, we, we used uh, a boom irrigation when we did the experiments that we did, but I really don't know if one helps above the other. I think most of the action is underground. So whatever you do, it, the water is going to end up in the ground. If it was something like a fungus that you're bouncing back onto the surface of your canopy, the question, the, the answer might have been different. Uh, and the more pressure that the water, that the irrigation is coming from above, the more likely you are to splash. But actually, I think because the action is underground in this case, it will probably have a very similar effect. Okay. But we don't know, and it's a very good question. Okay. Um, staying with Ian, um, this is quite a long question, so I might have to digest this one a little bit, um, but it's a good one. So, um, black leg, right, weather is good, um, and there's low black leg incidence at the point at which you want to start desiccating. Do you flail and use a PPO, risking increasing your, your black leg incidence, um, or but, but getting rid of your horn, you know, um, or do you go for just the PPO approach um, where you're going to be doing less of that disturbance, um, but you're potentially leaving green material there for longer? Um, and th I'm, I'm assuming they're thinking about blight. Yeah, I mean, I, it, again, it's a good question. I think that if the weather's dry and it's been dry for a while, then flailing is not such a bad thing to do. It's not, I mean, I, I hope I didn't get the give you the impression that flailing's bad it's not uh, but it is just one more thing that can increase contamination and compared to something like diquat or sulfuric acid then um, you know you probably you probably would use these chemicals in preference um, but it's not a bad thing and if the weather's good then it is okay to use and if it's removed then um, that's a really big uh, thing the, way, the time it's not great to use is if you already have some black leg in your field, because even if it's dry, you can be spreading your bacteria around. So if it's, so if it's dry, you don't have any or not very much black leg, it's fine to, to use that. Um, but if it's wet and you have black leg, then it should really be avoided. And it's, as I said before, it's worse in seed crops than it is in wear because you're going to contaminate your tubers and that's not great for seed. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to jump around between topics a little bit. So let's go to um, ah yeah, we'll go to to Jane and Andy. So um, could mineral oil phytotoxic symptoms be misinterpreted by inspectors as virus? Um, um, no, I mean we 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 looked at this a lot in the the previous project that we did and in the end the the inspectors concluded that no it it, it wasn't um an issue for them um, i think the only thing that they really said was that um they would like to know if a crop has had an oil spray and that that would enable them to be on the lookout for any sort of odd symptoms and we gave them a sort of um picture portfolio of all the things that we saw in the last project so that they were aware of what mineral oils might do um, but I mean fortunately we, we just haven't seen it this year and I think there is a variety effect on, on the expression of, of the symptoms that we, we did see um, but we just haven't seen it this year which is good yeah 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 Grand. if I can um, butt in a bit there as well you know, I think uh, the inspectors, you know, if, if they're in doubt at all, you know, they can take samples and they, and at least in Scotland, they will be get tested, um, you know, for the presence of virus. So, um, you know, there is a kind of a double protection there. So, uh, you know, no crop is going to be possibly downgraded um, based on any um, oil symptoms that may show up on the leaves. And I suppose as well next year, because your your project's going to be running um, next year, it's it's another season apart, so it's another opportunity to see different um, symptoms to to this year's work as well, and to build that up. Right. Uh, so, um, got another one for Jane and Andy. Is the use of mineral oil for virus control legal? I.e., are the products registered as plant protection products so it's it's a sort of how they're how they're registered um, well, i think it's um so crop crop spray 11e is 
is legal. Um, only H is not approved for use as a, well, for anything in the UK. Um, and Reaper, it could be next year. And I think it is registered as a crop protection agent in France and it is used a lot on potatoes um, and other crops in France as well. So and it, it is approved there. So I wonder whether you've got anything to add, Andy? Yeah, I mean, the one legal aspect, obviously, is, is that you can't use um, the oils on their own. They have to be applied with a plant protection product. So, so for example, if you're using crops for 11E, then, you know, there needs to be a say a, a blight fungicide, for example, going on with it at the same time. Uh, you can't use them on their own. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, you, know, you speak to the manufacturers um, and the suppliers, and you know, they are hopeful that OEH and um, Reaper, as it's known in France, or whatever it's going to be called, will get an approval, hopefully in time for next year. But, um, you know, we just have to wait and see on that score. But again, I think the results that come out of the NIAB trial this year might give um, give the likes of CRD a bit of a nudge in terms of um, looking at some of the data packages associated with these products. Yeah, that, that um, what you're saying there about other countries as well brings me on to a related question, which is what is the extent of oil usage within, you know, our competitor countries? Um, <clears throat> Um, well, I mean, I think I think in the likes of the Netherlands and France, you know, they use them extensively. Um, in Canada, I believe as well. I mean, Jane can correct me, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that you know they're using them from almost from kind of 10% or even 20% emergence in those instances. So um, you know, worldwide, you know, there's obviously an acceptance that um, the oils have an impact, um, and just perhaps the UK is just a bit slow to kind of uh, get onto the get onto the, um, the right path. Yeah. No, that's right. I, th I think the um, the Canadian work um, showed that they were really quite um, widespread in, in usage. And it was that very early um, start of spraying. And I think I forget the what the average number of sprays was, but I think it was either 11 or 12. And they were probably um, some some crops which receive more more than that. So um, yeah, it, it's it's common and unusual, I would think, in other countries. Okay. Um, come back towards sort of Mark and Andrew's direction. Um, somebody's asked a question about. Um, the, 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 you know, is there a relationship between, are, are you noticing a relationship between um, slug uh, prevalence, um, you know, slug populations increasing with increased cover crop frequency? So, are slug numbers going up? Um, my granddad always told me with these mustards when I started researching that, they give them a hot backside. So, um, he was at one frame of mind, but um, perhaps you're at another. Uh, well, uh, Pat Stark, I mean, in this particular project, that's not something we've been looking at, apart from perhaps anecdotal evidence from the growers we're working with. And the anecdotal evidence would suggest that there hasn't been an increase where they perhaps start to introduce um, cover crops into their rotations. There are other bits of work going on at the moment um, where that has perhaps been looked at in a bit more detail. and. Just to sort of flag this up, AHDB is producing or is compiling all the work on cover crops to actually have a, a publication on this. I'm sure that will be, be covered in that. But anecdotally, we ha haven't had any increase in slug problems in any work or no growers we've been dealing with. Uh, about you, Andrew? Um, I've not seen any slug problems. We have a little bit around the odd outside of the field, but as a farmer, I can't remember the last time we applied slug pellets on the farm. I am going back years and it's getting back to proper rotations and that we, yeah, I've, I've never, only slug pellets we have on the farm is what the wife has for the garden. <laughs> Good. Um, I've got a couple more questions and then we'll start to draw it to a close. Um, 
So there was one here for Ian. Um, ah, yes. So which nematodes are being considered for black flag interactions? Um, and is the mechanism of the interaction understood? Uh, another good question. We're, we're looking at free living nematodes as a group. Um, we, on a, on a sideline, we're also very, very interested in PCN and what PCN is doing, but not as part of this project. And I'm sure it's only a matter of time between, before we look at the interaction between PCN and black leg disease. At the moment, we're looking at these free living nematodes as a group. We know that they interact with plants in different ways. Some of them suck in the, the inside the root. Some of them chew the root. Uh, some of them might carry pectobacterium and actually vector the pectobacterium. The, the, the fact is we don't know. Now we know that as a population, something's happening. What we intend to do as part of the new project is to look at these populations individually and start to get a much better idea of what they're doing. And we've got some nice plans, for example, using some very fancy microscopes to see exactly how the different nematodes are interacting with pectobacterium and the root systems. Because if we can identify, what we don't want to do is to say, if you have free living nematodes in your field, you might have a black leg problem because they're just too common. But if we can say, if you have high levels of this particular species, which we don't know what it is yet, then we might be able to do a diagnostic and say, this field has quite high levels. We know that if you do this and if you do that, you're going to increase it. We know if you do this, you're going to decrease it and we can start to manage it much better. So the answer, the, the, the answer is we don't yet know, but we're absolutely intending to find out. Brilliant. Um, right, I'm going to, I've now got off my pieces of paper and I'm now onto my phone. So um, I've got one more question, I think, and then uh, we'll, we'll call things to a close. And the, the question is um, to uh, Andy and to Jane. Um, basically, it's about the use of pyrethroids and, and uh, for, you know, for, for control and um, how desirable this is um, when it, it's going to be damaging our natural enemies um, and the aphids could have resistance um, to these to these actives and what your thoughts are Andy <laughs> all right okay um, no it's, it's certainly a valid point um, you know the pyrethroids they are broad spectrum um, they will harm your beneficials, ladybirds, hoverflies, and so on. Um, you know, our hands are tied, you know, because we have the pyrethroids. Some of them are potentially under threat, so they might be disappearing. Things like cybermethrin, for example, and we use in other crops. Um, but we are losing the the aphids, the other aphids, the neonex. We've lost them. We've lost plenum. Um, so we are quite restricted in our chemical armory which is why i think you know we need to explore the likes of the oils the likes of whether you can use more cultural approaches as a package rather than just one silver bullet to try and reduce the the virus risk but uh, but no i mean you know I, I agree it's a valid point about um you know the reason we kind of still go with the pyrethroids to some extent is, is that they do have this repellent effect on aphids so that uh, they dissuade uh, the aphids from probing the leaf. So there is that element of reducing the virus transmission. But um, but yes, you know, um, you need to think of perhaps of the approach as virus transmission prevention rather than aphid control when you're looking at virus management programs on seed potato crops. You're wanting to reduce the virus transmission rather than Let's all the efforts. Yeah. Okay, so that draws us to a close. I think we've still got um, quite a few questions. So um, if I haven't covered your question, I do apologise. Um, but uh, we'll try and get some some answers back to you. Um, thank you very much to a panel of speakers. Um, that was a really cracking job. Um, yeah, very very interesting. Uh, in terms of the potato showcase week, 
um, which I would have forgotten, but, but my friendly Christian in the background has just put a slide up for me to read. Um, tomorrow, we've got a precision technology um, webinar, which Amber said yesterday that she, she was extremely excited about. It is also um, something I'm extremely excited about. I think it'd be really good. Um, and then we've got a spot farm um, session uh, and the close of the week on Thursday as well, where we're going to be talking about all the different things that um, we've been getting up to um, with the spot farm. So that's there's two more uh, good days coming up. Um, and also we're, we're going to be putting this um, on YouTube as well, so uh, you can catch up at a later date. Um, you can contact me on that email address, although not for too much longer, so you might have to co uh, contact one of my colleagues. Um, and uh, that, that draws us to a close. You will um, have a survey pop up um, very shortly once we close the webinar. Um, if I can encourage you to please give us some feedback, um, it would be much appreciated. Um, doing webinars is a little bit new to the team, but we're finding that overall they're quite successful. Um, we're picking up a new audience um, and we, we want to just make sure that things are getting better and better really. So um, if you fill that out, very much appreciated. Um, thanks very much. Yes.